you can never have too much of. Oftentimes, we are faithless. I want you to keep in mind, when you speak of faith, it, everything has to do with the Bible. It has nothing to do with the Word. When uh, the writers of the Scriptures, when it was written, everything was pertaining to God, Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit, the church. Everything is in that direction. Now there are a lot of preachers are preaching and in a falsehood that God wants us to be rich in this world and that is a lie. That is a lie. If it did, we'd all be millionaires and billionaires. Sometimes we set our sights on things that we want but it's not necessarily our needs. God did promise that he'd meet all our needs according to his riches and glory. And he has. And he always will. Uh, there's preachers that preach, name it and claim it. Well, you can name uh, a million dollar home. If you claim it, it doesn't mean that you're going to get what you name. So our sites according to the scriptures, need to be set on spiritual things instead of material things. And we're going to find out this morning more about faith than we ever thought we ever knew. I have. Uh, you may know more, but I promise you there is something here that will whet your appetite. Hebrews, the 12th chapter, starting at the first verse, Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which do so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, who, for the joy that was set before him, endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him that endured such contradictions of uh, sinners against himself, lest he be weary and faint in your minds. Now the first verse has a really, really good meaning and a deep meaning. He says that we are compassed, we're surrounded. We are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses. You can't walk outside and say, I see one cloud. I have never seen just one cloud in the sky. You walk outside and you look and you say, boy, it's cloudy and there's a lot of clouds or there's a cloud coming from the east. So he's telling us something that is... Uh, that is uh, uh, profane. He's telling us something that has some wisdom and knowledge in it. He says that we as saved people, as born again, as Christians, we have something we're compassed about with. And he calls it a cloud of witnesses. Now when it uses the word witnesses, it means that there's more than one thing that's going to testify about what he's trying and going to explain. So I want you to turn your Bibles back over to the 11th chapter, and we're going to see this cloud of witnesses. The cloud of witnesses. Now, these witnesses had something in common. Every witness that lived in the Old Testament had one thing in common. Not that they were rich, not that they were poor, not that they uh, were intelligent or dumb, but they had one thing <coughs> in common, and that was faith. Faith. We've got to understand what faith is if we're going to understand how we get it and what it does for us in our life. The first, in, in chapter 11, the first verse, it says, now faith. I want you to underline that. Now faith. What kind of faith? Now faith. Faith for today. Faith for this moment. Faith for tomorrow. Faith for the trials and tribulations. Now faith, and he's going to explain what it is. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. For by 
it is the elders obtain a good report through faith, underline that, through faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God so that the things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. Now, faith is a substance that's in our mind that we hope for, but we have not seen. Let me explain. I've never seen God. I've never seen Christ. I've never seen the Holy Spirit. I've never seen heaven. I've never seen uh, Noah. I've never seen Elijah. I've never seen any of the Old Testament characters. But that is faith, something that I believe in my mind and in my heart and in my soul that I know that was and that is and that always will be. Now, faith is a substance of things hoped for, things that we're looking forward to. Things, you say, well, I believe that I'm going to get to go on vacation this year. I used to say in school, I believe that I'm going to pass to the next grade. That means that wasn't a certainty, but I was hoping for it. That's not what it's talking about. Faith is something that you know, that you know, that you know. There's no doubt in it. Everything is signed, sealed, settled, and delivered. Uh, hope for the evidence of things not seen. Now, if you can see something, that's not faith. If, I could, if you ask me, do you believe that there is a car? Sure, I believe there's a car. Why? Because I can see it. Do you believe there's a highway? Yes, I believe there's a highway. Why? Because I can see it. Anything that you can see with your physical, visible eyes, it takes no faith at all to believe that. Like I said, it takes faith to believe that Jesus went to the cross. You hadn't seen the cross. You hadn't seen Christ. You hadn't seen the blood that was shed on Calvary. So it takes faith in order to believe that. Faith is seeing the unseeable. Faith is believing the unbelievable. That's where atheists run into problems. Because they want to see tangible proof with their eyes. And the reason they can't ever come to the knowledge of the truth of Jesus Christ is because they cannot believe. They cannot believe. And then in the second verse, it talks about our elders. They obtained a good report. How did they get the good report? It says, through faith. Through faith, understanding that the world were framed by God so that the things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. Let me explain. When God made everything, He made everything from nothing. There was no moon, there was no stars, there was no sun, there were no cows, giraffes, lions, fish, there was nothing, and God made something from nothing. How did he do it? Through faith. He believed, he knew, and he constructed everything. So everything that we see that's tangible came by faith. We didn't have anything to do with it. We did not make something from nothing. Everything that you and I make, we make it from something. I watched the bean crops around here. I didn't see the little beans being put in the ground, but now I can see the evidence that there was something there. But that was created from something else. The earth was created from something else. It said the earth was born without form, but God, but God made something from nothing. Now he's going to name a lot of characters in this 11th chapter. And we're going to see that every character is this great cloud of witnesses. Now, he's, Hebrews is a book that explains to the Jews about law and grace, beginning and end. So he's going to show us some Old Testament characters. 
You said, well, I didn't think they had to have faith in the Old Testament. Then I thought faith came in the New Testament with Christ and grace. That's not so. All the Old Testament characters had to have faith. So the 11th chapter and the 4th and the 4th verse, by faith. Now I want you to underline faith that every time I mention it and see how it gets here. By faith, Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, by the which he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of, of the gift, and by it being dead, yet speaking. Fifth verse, here it is again. By faith, Enoch was translated that he should not see death and was not found because God <coughs> had translated him. For before his translation, his testimony that he pleased God. Now there are two people in the Old Testament that never died. Enoch is one, who's the other? Elijah. Elijah. Elijah was taken up in a fiery chariot. So it says that Enoch pleased God. He pleased God, so God did not let him see death. How did he do it? By faith. Sixth verse, he explains something. But without faith it is impossible to please him, for he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. So if you say that I'm pleasing to God, but I don't have faith, you're lying. Right. If you say that I'm saved and born again, and you don't have faith, you're not saved. If you say that I believe that I'm going to be in the first resurrection, and you don't have faith, you're not going to be. If you say I believe I'm going to heaven, and you don't have faith, forget it, Jack. You're not going to heaven. So everything is surrounded, and he's telling us that everything that we have has to do with faith. This great cloud of witnesses, which is the Old Testament characters, they testify that they had faith. Now what their faith was, that they had not seen God, that they had not seen heaven, but they believed that it was. And they believed that the architect of salvation, the architect of heaven, the architect of eternal life came from one source, and that is God through Christ Jesus. Now, I'm over your heads. You still with me? This is a good time to holler. Oh, my God. That's a good place for me. So we see that without faith, I've got to have faith, faith, faith if I'm going to please God. If faith is not something I can see, but it's something that I believe that I know. Now my belief doesn't come because somebody taught me in school, but my belief comes from the Word of God. The only substance of my faith comes from the Word of God. When I read it, I believe number one selling book in the world is still the Bible. Still the Bible. And our government, our government is doing everything that it possibly can in order to stop the Word of God and the preached Word of God and the taught Word of God to get people to be saved and born again of the Spirit of God. They're working hard at it. Let me make one more comment. From all evidence that I can see, and this is a judgment or an assumption on my part, we elected a president because he told America what they wanted to hear. Now, I'm a fast reader of people. I, I uh, sum a person up, size a person up, in just a few minutes when I meet them. Any of y'all got that trait? Yeah. I look at them and listen to them very carefully and I sum them up and I say, oh, I know what kind of guy that is. But I found most of my assumptions have been wrong after I really got to know the guy. So our president, or even I, I could be pleasing to you after me summing you up 
if I told you everything that you like to hear and that would make you feel good. But truth is something different. Truth is something that is not a lie. It's not something you want to hear. But it is something that is good for you to cause you to straighten your life up. Amen. That's truth. So we see without faith we cannot be pleasing to God. Our president, this is my assumption, may not be true. I hear him speak of God. Heathens speak of God. Well, the world is incurable religious. They'll worship a stick, a stone, a monument, the sun, the moon, the stars. They know somewhere in their mind that there is something greater than them. So they're going to worship. But there's only one <laughs> true and living God. Now, on Friday... Our president will go to a Methodist church. And on Saturday, he'll go to a Lutheran church. He ain't never hit a Baptist church yet. That's an off course. That's out of sight. Now, you can go to church seven days a week and still live and be a lie. This is personal. This is personal. I believe that he is a Muslim. I believe that. Why do I believe that? It's because he will never, never, never say anything about Muslims. Never. And his supportiveness is everything in the Middle East to all the terrorists. And he doesn't have backbone enough to stand up and say they are wrong and they're going to destroy us if we don't destroy them. Now, that's Amen. just my opinion. Hallelujah. That's not, I can't prove it. But that's my opinion. I assessed him. I don't know whether my assessing is very good, but I assessed him. And I said, uh-huh. Now think on this. We'll get back to that in a minute. I just need to park a minute. Now think on this. You live what you believe. And it is evident to the world who you are and what you are. And if you don't think the world knows who you are and what you are, man, you are living a lie and the devil has pulled the wool over your eyes and you can't see truth. In the Old Testament, Moses went to Egypt and went before Pharaoh. And he said, let my people go. Pharaoh said, sounds like a good deal to me. I'll let them go. But then God said, uh-uh. And he hardened his heart. Time after time after time. We know from the teaching of the word that God has the power to harden a man's heart. Now this is chronology, what I believe. I believe that God has taken his hand off of America. I, I believe that. I agree. Does people get saved in America? Yes, they get saved. Yes, they get born again. But folks, when I started preaching, the houses would not hold the people that would come to hear the word of God. Amen. Now that is true. I have preached in churches when people stood outside the house full so that they could hear the Word of God. And it's getting less and less and less all the time. So I believe, this is personal, that God has blinded the eyes of our leaders and our <laughs> president and seared their conscience with a hot iron because nobody could be that stupid to make the decisions that they make. That's to hide the ignorance. They just, they couldn't. So I look and I say in my mind, it takes faith in order to resurrect a country. Now all these things that we're seeing, everything that we're seeing, 
is bringing us closer to the rapture and God taking his people out. Right. And it could occur today. At this moment, I couldn't even, I might not even finish this message and the Lord might say, come up hither and we'd be gone. Amen. That's a good thing. But the bad thing is all the people that have not heard and understood the truth and have had not faith in God that they might be saved. That's a terrible thing. So he's telling the Jews, he's telling us, the only way we can be pleasing unto God is by faith. Seventh verse. By faith Noah being warned of God of things not yet not seen as yet, moved with fear, prepared an ark to the saving of his house, by the which he condemned the world and became heir of righteousness, which is by faith. Eighth verse. By faith Abraham, when he was uh, called to go out into a place which he should, after receive for an inheritance, obey and he went not knowing whether he went. Ninth verse. By faith he sojourned in the land of the promise as in a strange country dwelling in tabernacles with Isaac and Jacob and the heirs with him of the same promise. For he looked for a city which had foundations whose builder and maker is God. Jesus had not come. God had not said you can have eternal life through Jesus, but he looked forward through faith and he believed that God was going to make a new heaven, a new earth, a new Jerusalem. Even though they had not seen them, they believed it. Amen. Now faith is the substance, is the substance of things hoped for, but yet it is not seen. They believed it. Now, he's saying this is that cloud of witnesses. That cloud of witnesses. Now, if you're going to convince a Jew about faith, the first thing you can do, and the only thing you can do, because the only Bible they have is the Old Testament, and they believe in Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and so forth and so on, they believe in them, and they know what it says. So, what uh, the writer of Hebrews is doing, he's saying, listen, I'm not preaching a, do a doctrine that's new. I'm preaching what our forefathers believed. They had faith. They were looking forward to something that they had never seen, that they could have that promise of God. Tenth verse, or eleventh uh, verse, through faith, and it's been talking by faith, now it says through faith. Also Sarah <coughs> received strength to conceive seed which was delivered of a child when she was past age because she judged him faithful who promised. She had faith even though her womb was dried up. She had faith because she uh, her body had gotten old. She had faith that she could still conceive and have a child. Why? Because she believed God. She believed the impossible. Now, if I would tell you that might be like Adele today, 91 years old, I would tell her that you're going to get married, which well, she's not. I don't think so. And you're going to have a child. She would look at me and say, have you lost your ever-loving mind? And you would look at me and say, Crow, you have flown the coop. Something bad is wrong with you. But Sarah is different than all the rest of us. She <laughs> believed God. How did it happen? She had faith in God. Now that's something the churches are like. That's something that our church is like. Come on, jump in the middle of it. Get you some of it. Amen. We can only see our nose and not past it. Faith is being able to see what nobody else sees 
And faith is something that you believe can happen that nobody else in the world believes it. Amen. Now, I believe that. Amen. This was a highlight of the ministry that God gave me. I stood in Haiti one night. And they took and they built a mound of dirt. And they had two Coleman lanterns. One on one side, one on the other side. As far as I could see, there were people. And I preached for about two hours with Coleman lanterns on a dirt pile. <laughs> Gave the invitation, no song, no piano player, no guitar, no organ. The people heard the word. They believed the word. They had faith in the word. And they came by the multitudes to get saved with Coleman lanterns. Amen. Man, no air conditioning. It was hot. Had lice on them. <coughs> you ever try to preach lousy? <laughs> I got to preach with lice on them. We had a guy from up in Kentucky, Billy Joe Lovett. I don't even know whether he's still living or not. Man, he, I'm country now, but look at this old boy. He definitely, he got him a double dose of it. And there we had been two weeks without a bath, preaching every day and at night. And we were, life was crawling all over us. And here I was up getting ready to preach, and I said, now this is getting bad, Billy Joe. I'm telling you what. These things are crawling all over me. This is what he said. He said, Glenn, you know what? I said, what? He said, that's just another case of there you are. <laughs> <laughs> so that's kind of become my thing. Anything that happens, I said, well, that's just another case of there you are. I can't do anything about it. So you just learn to live with it. If your life can be changed, and the only way it can be changed is by faith. You're not going to change it any other way. It's going to be changed. It's what you believe. You believe you can be a soul winner? I don't know about that witness. Well, you won't. You're not going to be a soul winner. You don't believe it. You believe our church is going to be filled next Sunday? Well, I don't know whether I can witness or not. I can't invite anybody. It's not going to be. No. Why? Faith. Now, you just can't say, I believe it. Your actions will prove whether or not you believe. Don't hold your hands up. How many this past week went out of their way and made an effort to ask somebody to come to the house of God to hear the word of God? Don't hold your hands up. But how many of you made a phone call to gossip about somebody and tell somebody, did you hear? Did you know? Now, it didn't require any faith to call somebody or meet somebody at the grocery store, or tell somebody about somebody else. That took absolutely no faith. Because that's our nature. <laughs> My nature's to gossip. How about yours? <laughs> My nature's to say, hey, do you hear that? Do you know what I heard? <laughs> but our nature is not to believe God when He said it's not His will that any should perish but all come under repentance. That takes faith. It takes faith when he says that look on the fields, why didn't the harvest? He said it's ready, but boy, there are few people that have go out and gathered it up. I done got you beat down, so I'll quit. Just that along. <laughs> but you know what that is? That's truth. Right? That's truth. I don't want to hear that. Well, you've done hurt it. Now comes conviction. Now comes saying, boy, I wish he hadn't said that because I know what I need to do now. 
That's called faith. So Sarah said, I believe God that I'm going to have a baby. It's literally impossible because I'm too old. Twelfth verse, therefore, spring there even of one, and him as good as dead, so many are the stars of the sea in multitude, and as the sand which is of the seashores innumerable. Now it says that Abraham seed was dead. A woman that the womb is dried up and impossible and a man that has no seed and God said, you're going to have a child. That is ludicrous. Was God out of his mind? Did God know what he was talking about? God always does the impossible. What's possible, what's impossible with man is always possible with God. Amen. Always. Amen. He always takes the things that man cannot do, and that's exactly what he does. Thirteenth verse, these are dead in faith, not having received the promise. But having seen them afar off and were persuaded of them and embraced them and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on earth. Now that's a strange thing. They did not look at their circumstances, but they looked afar in faith, believing, believing that God was going to give them a home in eternity. They believe that. And what did they say about the earth? It says that they confessed that they were strangers and they were pilgrims. Strangers and pilgrims. They confessed that they didn't have a country. We confess that we are citizens of the United States of America. But let me go one step further. I'm a citizen of the kingdom of God. I am a child of God. I can't see it with my physical eyes, but I can see it with my spiritual eyes in my soul. Let me tell you about your citizenship in America. They're going to plant you in the cemetery with a headstone. That's where your citizenship's going to end up. You can't vote. You can't go to the Red lobster. And you can't fish. And I can't race. That's a terrible thing. Amen. But see, it requires no faith to do what we do. Because that's natural. It requires faith to say, my eyes are set on a heavenly home. I believe with all my heart, mind, body, and soul. I believe for every person that I win to the Lord, God is going to reward me. Amen. I believe for every time I tithe and give above that tithe, God is going to reward me. Amen. I believe for every person that has less than me, that has a need, if I give and meet that need, God is going to reward me. Amen. And you know what that's called? Laying a treasure in heaven. Amen. That's what it's called. Now, I don't want to get up there and pull out the drawer of my safe deposit box and find moths in it. I don't want to pull it out and find in there I owe you. I want to pull out my drawer and God said these are your rewards because of your faith that you was willing to put into action and you were willing to bring people to Jesus Christ. Your faith. That's where our treasure comes from. That's where our reward comes from because we believe God. 14 verse. We're going to get to our text in a minute. I'm just warming up. For they that say such things declare plainly that they seek a country. They 
they said they were strangers and pilgrims here. And if they were strangers and pilgrims, they were confessing this was not their country. But by faith they said, I've got a country. I have got a place. He's talking in reference to their heavenly home. They believed it. They had faith in what God was telling them. 15th verse, and truly if they had been mindful. Now somebody tell me what mindful means. And none of that. Think. It's in your mind. Thinking. I've had people tell me, you're crazy. And I said, why am I crazy? Why, what you're saying, you really think that? You really believe that? Yes, I do. So that's what he's telling them. And truly, if they had been thinking, they had been thinking of that country from whence they came out, they might have had opportunity to have returned. Now, where were their thoughts? What were they thinking about? They were thinking about heaven. They were thinking about rewards. They were thinking about eternal life. How do I know that? He said, because if they hadn't, they'd been thinking about the old country and they'd have turned around and walked back into Egypt. So their thoughts, their thinking process. Now I've struggled with this all my life. Some of you may struggle with it. Do you ever struggle with what you used to be? Now where does that take place? Up there. I, and I talk about it. It says let our conversation be in heaven. But my conversation so many times is what I did wrong. And not only did that, but I get big tickled about it. And I can turn around and say, whoo! And everybody says, boy, it's a good one, Crow. But if I was really, really, really where I need to be, I wouldn't be looking back, thinking back. I'd be looking to the country that is made by God and not be looking at back the things that I did because of the lust of my flesh. Amen. Now I'm giving you truth this morning. Hang on to it. Stay with me. If you want to jump up, clap your feet and shake your hands and holler glory, hallelujah, I'm used to it. It's been a while since I've seen it. But I'll tell you what, I've been exposed to it in my life. If you've ever been exposed to it, it won't hurt you. 16th verse, but now, now he's been talking about faith. Now he's going to give us something that we need now, but now they desired a better country that is a heavenly Wherefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he hath prepared for them a city. 17th verse, here it comes. By faith, Abraham, when he was tried, by faith, Abraham, when he was tried, offered up Isaac, and he had received the promises offered unto his only begotten son, of whom it was said, that in Isaac shall thy seed be called, accounting that God was able to raise him up even from the dead, from whence also he received him in a figure. Now, this is what he's telling us. God told Abraham to go up on the mount, build an altar, lay Isaac down, take a knife, and kill him. This is what it's saying. That Abraham believed God. That if he did plunge the knife, that God would raise Isaac back from the dead. He believed it. That's why he didn't sputter. That's why he didn't hesitate to plunge the knife through the heart of his only son. Because he knew. He believed. He had faith that God would raise him up if he killed him. Now 
Now that's a figure of what was going to happen to Jesus. He's going to die on the cross and he is going to be resurrected from the dead. I'll go faster. 20th verse, by faith Isaac blessed Jacob and Esau concerning things to come. 21st, and by faith Jacob. 22nd, by faith Joseph. 23rd, by faith Moses. 24th, by faith Moses. 25th, the latter part of it, that to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. Now they chose to serve God, believe God, and have faith in God, rather to, in, that, to enjoy sin for a season. Now I'm going to give you a truth now. Sin is fun. Sin is pleasurable. Sin is something that we all, before we got saved, like to do. I enjoyed sin. It brought something to me. I got a rush out of sin. I got a thrill out of sin. But that's for a season. It's just a fleeting moment. Now, at my age, what I did when I was 20, even if I wasn't saved, my mind <laughs> wouldn't be on that. My mind this morning was on getting Miss Barbara down the ramp. That was my biggest goal. I ran around the house. I said, what do you need now? I said, get out of my way. I was trying to push here, push there. I wanted to put her makeup on, but I never offered it. I said, what do you want to wear? She told me. And I went in the closet. I got found the pants right off, but I said, please, Lord, help me to get the right one. <laughs> she sent me in there four or five times the day we went to the doctor. I come out and I said, is it this one? No, it's not that <laughs> She said, it's got a butterfly on it. So I looked for a butterfly. I couldn't find a butterfly. And I found it. I said, is it this? No, it's not that one. I thought, what difference does it make you put something on and bring it along? I didn't have much faith in my ability to pick out a blouse because every one I picked out was wrong. So I, and I'll tell you what, when I went in this morning, I didn't go with much faith. But not hardly a smidgen did I walk in there. I thought I'd get it wrong. 27th verse. By faith. 28th verse. Through faith. 29th verse. By faith. 30th verse. By faith. 31st verse. By faith. 39th verse. In the middle of it. Through faith. Alright, that's introduction. I'm going to preach long. Everything has to do with faith in the 11th chapter. That's why he says, wherefore, in the 12th chapter. Because all the Old Testament characters had faith. Wherefore does that put us? Where does it put us? It says, we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses. He's naming now those in the 11th chapter. Then he says, let us lay aside every weight. Why? Because we're in a race and because we're super athletes for God. I don't care if you weigh 502 pounds or you weigh 90 pounds. You're an athlete for God. So he said, lay aside every weight. Now if I'm getting ready to run in a track race, I'm not going to put hip boots on. And I'm not going to strap around me 50 pounds if I was going to go diving to pull me down in the water. I wouldn't put on an overcoat. Why? Because those are things that would hinder me from accomplishing what I wanted. So he said that we ought to take these things off. We ought to lay these things aside. Do you know the reason we, that we suffer defeat? is because we're always wanting something to satisfy our flesh 
that it's impossible for us to give. That's a good place to hop. That's true. We want that. We desire that. I can remember the first home that Barbara and I bought. I remember the second home we bought. I remember the two farms that we bought. I remember all the new automobiles and trucks that we bought. I remember all the things that we bought. Bought a ski boat. Bought a new travel trailer. Went to the factory and had it made to our specs and just like we wanted it. Didn't take much faith to do that. But everything that we did was to feed the flesh. Then I discovered one day there's more to life than that. Then I got saved. Born again. Yeah, I may have told you this, but it won't hurt you. If I, you, if I have, you just act like it's brand new to me. <laughs> when we went on the road, we were in St. Louis. We incorporated. We uh, put together a foundation called Investing in Souls Foundation Incorporated. Had an attorney, CPA, had board members, and we kept books, our CPA kept books. Everything came in, everything went out. They, we got a call from the IRS. That's back when, uh, in the 70s, when evangelism was really big. And they said, we're going to check you. Bring your books in. Took them in for eight hours. They grilled and looked over them. And finally the flesh overcame Glenn. I had all I wanted. I'm saved, a preacher. Now I'm going to show myself. You ever show yourself? <laughs> and I told that lady who was doing the audit, I said, let me tell you. I'm getting my stuff. I'm going to the house. And if you want to see me, you send a man with a badge and I'll spend my time in jail with you. I guess I told her. <laughs> the next year, the next year, somebody showed up at the office. The secretary came up and she said, Glenn, somebody wants to see you. Red-headed man. I walked out there and it's a United States Marshal with a badge on. <laughs> and I, I said, I'm going to jail. I told them to come and get me. Now they've come and got me. So out of necessity, I called Barbara. <laughs> and I said, I'm going to jail, Barbara. She said, what do you do now? <laughs> I said, they got us on our taxes, and I got a U.S. Marshal. And I got defensive, and we went to the house, and I got our books out. And it took him about 10 minutes, maybe 15, and he said, well, there's the problem, said the CPA, put the wrong number in the wrong place and computers can't read. <laughs> he said, in fact, we owe you money. <laughs> <laughs> so I swelled up and I said, I guess I told her. <laughs> but the reality of it is, better keep your mouth shut when you don't know what you're talking about. Right. But I still have an opinion. That don't work too good. Great cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight. And then it says, and the sin which so easily beset us. Every one of us have something in our life that bothers us worse than anything else. Right. Amen. I guarantee you none of us have got the same thing. If you set a whiskey bottle up in front of me, that wouldn't bother me. If you open beer and sit there and drink it in front of me, that wouldn't bother me. A lot of things don't bother me, but I'm not going to tell you what does. But there's one thing in my life that causes me to struggle. And I pray about it, and I ask God to help me with it, and it goes away for a while, but then it'll crop its ugly head back up, and here we go again. Right. Yeah. 
Now he said that we need to lay aside those things that are hindrance and get aside, lay aside that sin that so easily. Now what's upset your alpha car? Let me give you something. Say I come into church this morning and you're sitting there and I pass by you and I turn my head and don't say anything and you've got a chip on your shoulder waiting for somebody to flip it and you say, I'm not coming back down there anymore because Glenn didn't say anything to me and I seen him back there hugging the neck of old so-and-so and he likes them better than me. He likes them better than me. He don't appreciate me. He don't appreciate what I do. Is that the thing that bothers you? had nothing to do without here doing any great sin as the world would call sin, but maybe that bothers you. God said you need to get rid of it. Put it under the blood. Don't fool with it. Don't bother with it. And this is the reason why. And let us run with patience. The word patience means perseverance. Endurance. The race that is set before us. Now here's the race. We get saved. Born again by the Spirit of God. Our eyes are, are focused. And so we've got a race. Now everybody in this world has a calling and has a gift. Everybody that gets saved. You might not like what you've got to do for God. You might not ever acknowledge the gift that God's given you, but you've got it. So he says that we are, have a race and we need to run that race. A lot of distractions. A lot of things that will divert us and get us off of our trail. Uh, Tina and Sabrina and Mary Lou and Brian down to see us in Alabama one time. They got him a motel room. All right, did I tell you? Both of them. And so we got all set, and we told them how to get to the church. It came church time. I waited outside till the last minute, and I called and couldn't get. So we went inside, and I told Barbara. I said, I've called and called. You try. So Barbara went out. And they never made it. And I said, where are you? God, they were on the other side of the world. <laughs> and I said, how did you get there? We sent the GPS, Kennedy. <laughs> we sent the GPS. Them things are lies. <laughs> Give me a map. Give me a map. This is what a map is. This is the map. Give me a map and I can find where I'm going because it's written down. It does not change. It, it's never reprinted to change it up. It's always the same. And besides that, my God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And His instructions are clear. Amen. You say, are you against GPS? No, I don't know how to work one. Don't have any desire to work one. If you do, I love you. <laughs> That's fine. But I still like a map. We got an atlas. I sit down and map out where I'm going. And I don't want to leave it up to somebody in Detroit or in Japan for me to program in something. Because I would probably get lost. And we've got a race. Second verse, almost done. Looking unto Jesus. Now focusing. Focusing on Jesus. All right, you're driving down the road. You're focused. And your phone rings. Can I tell this, Barbara? Uh -huh. Barbara puts her <laughs> phone in her purse. And she puts it behind the front seat. Regularly. And so she's giving it this shot. <laughs> <laughs> and I, it, I've stayed patient, don't I? <laughs> but I'm telling you.
telling you it about hers. <laughs> oh, it boils inside. <laughs> and I say very lovingly, Barbara, when you get in the car, why don't you put your phone in the console right here? <laughs> and her purse, she's got from screwdrivers, wrenches, <laughs> she's got every utensil. I don't have as many tools in a toolbox that high as she's got that top bag. She said, my shoulder's hurt. I said, no wonder. And you're carrying around 200 pounds. She told me the other day, go in and look in my purse. Uh -oh. <laughs> I'd rather take a whip. And she said, she told me, she said, it's so-and-so and so-and-so -and -so under so-and-so over there. Here I go. I put my hand in there. I'm going to do like her and I feel it. I can't find it. Bring it here. Usually I just take it, give it that shot, and just go through it, find it, and scoop it all back in there. I can't find nothing. Somebody bit in my purse. How can y'all don't want this lady's gone? Valley and who comes here but in the Word of God. Let's stand by. 